Hello everyone. I am Sardar Janan, the founder of Egomonk, and today we're joined by Harriet Kingaby. Harriet is a co-founder of the Conscious Advertising Network and a Mozilla Fellow. She is a multi-award-winning communication specialist and brand safety strategist, working with some of the world's biggest and smallest brands. She is passionate about mapping the impact of AI-enhanced advertising globally and wants to make sure that brands stay accountable and responsible to us. Okay, so first of all, thanks so much, Harriet, for, for being a part of the show and, and talking to us. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Same here. So um, the big question I have is that, you know, AI enhanced advertising is already mainstream and it appears really monolithic, complicated. So the question I have is, in terms of user preferences or targeting or personalization of online profiles, how rich is this data set actually? That is a very good question. So I think the richness of data sets depends on just how many points of information that you know, kind of the data brokers or the, whoever you're working with is gathering things from. Um, and when we think about um, those data points, actually they are getting more and more and more uh, kind of profligate. So things like um, now with the Internet of Things, we can start to gather data from, um, you know, kind of how people behave offline as well as online. Um, and obviously with things like your social media profiles, it's very easy for us to kind of, for, for, you know, organizations to gather data about you. So the potential for, you know, the, this rich data is, is quite large and it's getting bigger as, as our, um, our online kind of world blends with our offline world. But there are a few issues with this kind of very rich data set. The first of which is a lot of these, this, these data points are inferred data points, meaning it's not necessarily the kind of stuff that I, that I might hand over to another, another, another person, another organization, but it is inferred from my behavior. So for example, um, I'll use the example of uh, kind of, I think, um, interests. So if I follow lots of um, Twitter accounts, for example, that suggest that, uh, you know, I like dogs, then it's inferred that I like dogs, even though I might be researching something for a project or, um, you know, kind of following them because my sister's really into them. It's a silly example. So although these data sets are potentially quite, uh, quite rich, there are issues with quality. And there are, I think, also issues when we think about just whether your average human being really wants all this data to be collected about them. So, you know, there's a study I've uh, seen about from Dot Everyone, right, that estimates that 84% of the data collected is, isn't even used yet. So uh, probably with AI and ML, this is going to get, you know, finally get exploited by the big tech. So what is the real risk of, of finally getting this, the rest of our data actually being used? Uh, what would it change in terms of advertising or in terms of targeting? I think it becomes, the more data points you've got, it becomes more easy to predict uh, what a kind of human being might want or where the, you know, what kind of stage um, of their day they, they, they are at, what emotional state they might be in, how um, likely they might be to respond to an organization's messages. You know, I think with all of, with all of this data being collected, machine learning does give us the, 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 the opportunity, I think, to really kind of use this in, in, in in, in better ways, but for what end? Um, if it is, is it just to kind of sell us stuff? Well, sometimes we've also found examples of data brokers handing over these huge data sets to state actors um, and law enforcement in, in places like Chile and, and the US. So my, I, th I think my answer is whatever that data, what, what that, it's the way that that data is used, not necessarily how much of it is collected that, that, that starts to feel really problematic. And I think the issue for brands and advertisers is, do we really want to be associated with these kind of surveillance methodologies going forward, given the kind of unrest we're seeing in, and social unrest in the world at the moment? Is that, does that really feel like the way that we want to go when our stated aim is really to build relationships with, with, with our customers and our consumers? Um, and, you know, so yes, I think it's a huge and kind of problem, a knotty problem, really. So you know, the internet is a place where we can exist uh, pseudonymously, anonymously, and in, and socially. And social has become the default identity layer because it helps, as you said, brands and marketers sell us things uh, almost to a creepy level, right? They could target us. Um, why do you think it's important for these other identity layers of pseudonymity or anonymity to exist? 
Yeah, so advertisers use pseudonymized data in order to um, make sure that they're not, uh, you know, not, I suppose, not keeping too much on file about us. Um, but I think the issue with pseudonymized data is that we can often, you know, I think between four and 15 data points is enough to individual ident individually identify somebody. So that kind of pseudonymized level is, is, is useful when it comes to um, ensuring that, you know, not too much, not too much is being, is being stored. Anonymous, um, are, anonymous identities online are hugely important and also create tensions. Um, so being anonymous on, on social platforms, for example, has given us the opportunity to speak out in ways that perhaps we, we, we couldn't before, um, to kind of street speak truth to power, to um, you know, make comments that perhaps, or perhaps make observations that we perhaps wouldn't be able to otherwise, either because perhaps we would we might be judged or censored or perhaps there could be uh, you know kind of state actors could could persecute us um however this freedom also comes with a bit of a kickback because what we're seeing is um kind of our anonymous our anonymous kind of identities online are also complicit in things like online harassment and bullying in spreading misinformation Something that we do at the Conscious Advertising Network, for example, is um, we are a, a network of, of, of organisations on a, uh, with a mission to ensure the ethics catches up with the technology of modern advertising. And what um, we, we, we look at various different areas, including things like hate speech and misinformation. And what we try and do is to bring um, representatives to marginalised communities together with advertising stakeholders. Because what we were finding is that issues in online advertising were affecting uh you know kind of are affecting marginalized communities but there's they, marginalized communities themselves don't have a voice at the table so these problems are being defined and attempted to be solved by advertisers talking to advertisers and actually when you get the real and authentic voices around the table what you find is that um, a it, it creates more accountability because there's no human being on earth that can listen to i think many other human beings tales of of um of kind of discrimination and, and not be moved and, and by them yeah and also, the yeah with a few exceptions <laughs> um but also it creates uh it it lays it lays the foundations to create better solutions um because those solutions are kind of co-created together so i think it can be very tough if you are experiencing discrimination as a result of of, of algorithmic decision making and artificial intelligence but it becomes even more important that we create these forums and that we collaborate um, because the solutions will be better. Do you think these consumers can do anything you know to, to for example petition their representatives or other public institutions in their uh, you know home nations to to safeguard their digital rights because it seems like big tech has, operates on its own universe you know on its own uh, legal system. Absolutely, and I think this is it is so important that we um, that that we regulate and create incentives for big, big tech to change. Um, and I think that mod, um, you know, kind of citizens talking to their local representatives about what is needed is hugely important. We've seen with things like the you know, the, the U.S. Senate questioning Facebook. Um, we see if we look at the governance lag in advertising technology, which is about 12 years before we had appropriate legislation. Um, what we can see is that those kind of lags create and embed um, behaviours that, or precedents that can really, uh, you know, can cause serious harm. So absolutely, I think that you know, talking to represent our, our representatives about what is needed definitely helps. But I think there is also a skills gap there when it comes to understanding how we can regulate. Um, how we can regulate big tech and what those business models are that need to be uh, that need to be changed. The Conscious Advertising Network is a um, what we've done is we've looked at areas where kind of ad advertising technology is failing um, and is causing harms uh, to society or individuals. And we've said, right, here's practical frameworks for how you can deal with those issues so that we help advertisers rather than saying to advertisers, look, you're causing this problem. We say to them, and here is the solution. So, for example, our manifestos cover things like children's welfare, um, fake news and misinformation, um, hate speech. And what we've tried to do is pull things like from the where the UN defines hate speech and how you balance countering hate speech with ensuring freedom of speech. We've 
added those definitions in there. We signpost to initiatives that are already in existence that um, you know, kind of help ensure that, that, that advertising is diverse and inclusive, for example. So what we've done is we've created an industry level kind of code of ethics and a, and a, and a, um, and a roadmap for that industry to change. So there's several ways in which advertising and hate speech are linked. The first of which is um, kind of through programmatic placement on the open web. So you know, this, is, this is websites um, you know, kind of that, that you or I may, may, may go to, special interest websites, et cetera. Um, and what's happening there is that organizations can set up a website um, and um, kind of specifically create more salacious content. So that might be hate speech or misinformation. And that, uh, and then um, kind of, and then sell advertising inventory on that, on that website. What happens then is often that content is then shared to social media. And because it is so outrageous or it is, um, you know, kind of, it is so emotionally driven, then it starts to kind of get, gain engagement on social media and you get more people directed back to the website and that the owner of that website you know, kind of gains advertising revenue. And the most um, famous example of this problem was um, the, the kind of Macedonian teenagers who, who were behind Pizzagate, um, who kind of essentially were creating um, misinformation around the uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, kind of bid for president um, and earning like a lot of money doing that. So that's model one. Model two is when you have um, kind of misinformation or, or kind of hate speech channels um, from particular actors. So this might be a YouTube channel, uh, you know, kind of it might be a Facebook page, whatever this is. Um, and this uh, kind of channel is, is, is monetized through, through advertising, pre, maybe pre-roll advertising, which appears before the video, for example. Um, and here the problem is that actually because this content is salacious and because it gains lots of responses, um, it is seen as uh, kind of actually good, good to, to advertise against because the engagement rate is high. Um, and so what you see is hate preachers um, you know, kind of with major brands uh, kind of advertising on, on, on those channels. Um, and that is a really a fault in the way that we measure success. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, it has created a funding model for, for, for both misinformation and for um, hate speech itself, which is, is, is super concerning. Um, and that's one of the things we tackle through CAN. We help advertisers to understand how they can audit their, you know, their, 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 their media spend for, and, and avoid this kind of stuff. So, you know, you raise this point of this, it's paradoxical almost that hate speech or disinformation, misinformation often is emotionally charged and that creates a lot of engagement. And if you're optimizing for that or your algorithms are, then you are inadvertently falling into that trap. So do you think um, preventing AI-enhanced advertising to feed into that uh, recommendation engine, which is often proprietary and, and it's a black box, uh, should that be par for the course? Is that, uh, say, something that comes to mind for you? I, I mean, I think that machines aren't great at making decisions for us yet. And AI in particular is not very good at picking up nuance. So when we're optimizing, you know, if we're optimizing for engagement um, through you know, the way we place advertising on these platforms, then we're missing the bigger picture um, because we're missing, you know, kind of what does that, is that, what does that engagement really mean? Where is our advertising actually ending up? So in my mind, we've just got to get better at understanding when humans need to be involved in the mix, which I think is more often than it is now, and where the tech needs to improve. Um, and we also need to interrogate the metrics that we use, because what we're seeing is if you're just, um, you know, if you're just optimizing for engagement, if you're just optimizing for reach, it means that advertising is going in, going to places that you or I can never imagine. Um, it, you know, lots of, it, lots of money's being lost to fraud, it's going to the wrong places. So what we advocate is for, for actually for advertisers to take a more manual approach, devolve a little bit of, you know, kind of take a bit of responsibility back from algorithmic decision making. So have you observed any differences when it comes to regulation of technology and the demand or nuance probably for digital rights in developed economies versus emerging economies in your research? Definitely. So I think the big, um, there, are, I mean, there are lots of differences. And in my research, I've looked mainly at India 
um, Brazil and the UK, but with other markets kind of included. And I think the big, the big, dif the big difference really is, is the, the presence of data protection laws. Because if you've got data protection laws and, le and that are being enforced, at least you have a sense of kind of the, the usage, uh, the reasons that people's data is being being gathered. You've got um, users have a bit more control over where that data, you know, kind of what they consent that data to be done. And in the back end, you you know you don't have actors sending data to lots of different sources in theory that the user didn't give consent for. So that kind of protects people against things like data being gathered for, for ostensibly for advertising purposes and then given to the state or given to you know kind of third third parties that, that, that kind of may be involved in fraud or things like that um, that's a huge a huge one and then we've got very different approaches to the use of biometric data so in some countries for example it is you know is law that you but you you give your biometric data to the state as part of your identity um you know kind of your identity program so that the state can can you know kind of to, can actually know who you are you know kind of through fingerprints through through iris scans whatever that is um and other and other countries take a very 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 different approach and uh you know and you know for, for example um you know kind of I think places like Germany are very, very, very strong on their on their privacy laws and individual privacy. So it's a huge, um, you know, there are huge uh, kind of changes in the way that, that countries um, kind of legislate and, and, and regulate. And I think um, what we are seeing with things like the CCPA coming in in California, for example, is that more organisation uh, that, that more countries are considering data protection as a, a you know kind of as a serious next step. I know there's a, there's a draft bill happening in India at the moment and, and Brazil has, has just, I think, put into law its own data protection legislation based on, which looks very different to GDPR, um, you know, and reflects, uh, you know, the, Brazilian, the really strong consumer protection laws that Brazil has, for example. Um, but I think that for me is the, is, is the biggest differentiator. Do, do countries have that? Um, and if they do, it, it, changes, it changes the way that data is handled significantly.